Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. We have Nathan Osmond on the show, and he is an amazing gentleman. He is has a ton of hats, and he he kind of does it all. He he's coaching, he's speaking, he's in movies, he does it all. And he's he's <laughs> he's the man. I got to tell you, he is the man. <laughs> my publicist, ladies and gentlemen, how are yeah, you, Stacy? There you go. I give you your publicist. Yeah. You see my so hat collection. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of hats. <laughs> and so he's here today. We're gonna just shoot the shit, and we're gonna talk about life. And let's you know, do it. Yeah, you know, there's a lot going on in this world today. And we just want to dive into some of the things that we feel are important to kind of emphasis on and, and emphasize and, and really, you know, uh, talk about like different solutions and different ways to approach things in life. Yes. It's so good to be on here with the advisor, Stacy. You like have written like over 20 books. It's incredible. <laughs> the knowledge of this lady who's hanging out with Ariana Huffington and Dr. Oz, and you know, you've rubbed shoulders with the biggest and the best. And it's just so fun. And I'm so honored to be on your show. And like you said, you know, our whole mission in this life really is to help people to step into their greatness and inspire others to do the same, you know, to guide them toward that vibrant well being and personal growth. And, you know, it all starts with finding a friend in the mirror because you got to take care of you. You're all about health, right? You've written a lot about health. And and uh, I love the topic of mental health because I don't know if you've turned on the news lately, but it's kind of depressing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we are just thrown, stuff's thrown at us. I mean, you just watch this big bridge collapse into the river there in yeah. Baltimore. And you're like, what's going on in the world? There's Russia and Ukraine and there's Taiwan and China. And what, what's going to happen? And so much that we worry about. Let me ask you a question. Can you control what China does? No. Because <laughs> I, we... I can't. You know, can you control what the president does or those running for office? I can't. And yet we spend so much of our time focused on stuff we have no control over. Right? Yeah. And we, we, we just sit here and stew. They say about 90 some odd percent of what we worry about never, ever happens. Yes. That's right. Ever. And yet we wasted so much time and energy and health Yes, worrying about stuff that we ought not even be worrying about. Is it okay to think about things? Sure. But there's a time when you got to turn that TV off or turn off that scrolling you've been doing. Yeah. Just give your brain a little bit of love, exactly. you know, because a lot of people, I just had lunch with a gentleman. I'm sorry I was late today because we got into life. We got into like this self help yeah. and, and love and personal development and be careful what you tell yourself because you might believe it. We become what we think about most of the time. And I think that's interesting that they call that a, the secret, right? right. Um, <laughs> there's a, a recording that was put out for the, from this gentleman who had his business. And he said, you know, the strangest secret was what it was called. And in it, he says, you become what you think about most of the time. Yeah. And isn't that interesting? You know, there are exceptions. Most men would become a young woman if that were the case, you know, by the yeah. age of 16. But the thing is, is that in most cases, you'll become what you think about most of the time. So my question I like to ask your listeners is, what are they thinking about? Yeah. What? How much time are you spent focused on the things you hear about in the news? Right. Are you only thinking about your job? I know for men, that's a big issue because- yeah. We kind of like associate our self-worth on based on what we do. I'm guilty mm -hmm. of doing that. Yeah. As a man, I'm like, okay, this is who I am. Is is who you are. You just talked about the different hats I wear. People say, wait, are you a mortgage guy? Are you a country singer? Are you a speaker? Are you a dad? Are you like a nursery worker in Sundays in church? Or I mean, how many other hats do you wear? You're in movies. You like, yes, I was just at a movie premiere yesterday, you know, last night. But the thing is, is that. Why can't you be all those things? Right. And really, are those things who you are? Because I don't know that we really stop to think about that question. Who are you? Yeah. I met someone really special last night. Um, he's actually one of the 12 apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, one of 12 men that have that title in the world. Right. And I shook his hand. I said, hi, I'm Nathan Osmond. And you know what this incredible man said to me? He grabs my hand grabs my elbow. He says, tell me about Nathan. Like whoa, that. That's whoa, powerful. mind blowing. Yeah. Like where do, where, where, what do I, what do I start with? Like, right. It, it, it was such a simple yet powerful question. 
And I like to put that question towards your listeners today. Tell me about feeling your name right there. Yeah. Because who are you? Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes we ask that question, who am I to be on, you know, Stacy's podcast, the advisor, like what, 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 I haven't written 20 books and we just beat ourselves up. We right. all have value. Mm-hmm. We have eternal worth. And I don't know that we look at ourselves in that light at times. In fact, we probably beat ourselves up most of the time. Cause I like to ask that question, Stacy, when I'm on stages and stuff, I say to people, yeah. by a show of hands, how many in this room talk to yourself? Let me see your hands. And and most mm-hmm. hands go up. And I say, and the people that aren't raising their hands are going, I don't know. Do I talk to myself? You just did it. <laughs> you know <what> I'm <laughs> we all do it. Yes. And it's healthy. They actually say it's a sign of genius. But my point is, is what are you saying to yourself? Right. Do you know who you are? Is it just a profession? Are you just a podcaster? Are you just an author? Are you just, no, you're so much more than that. Right. But sometimes we just don't stop to think, you know, we watched a movie last night called Escape from Germany. It's an amazing movie by T.C. Christensen, who was there last night. It was about how they got all these missionaries out of Germany, you know, just before they attacked Poland and the World War II broke out and all these miracle stories, you know, and it was just amazing to be there. And there was a guy that led that country down a really dark path. He had a weird mustache. And I don't even want to quote the guy, but you know what he said? He said, what luck for leaders that men do not think. Ooh. And when you think about who said that, and he wasn't even a German, and he led that country down a really bad path. Yeah. You know, and I just think how many people just blindly follow and they get somebody that's noisy and flashy and says all the right things and they just follow like sheep. There's too many sheep. That's why I like that quote. Yeah. What luck for leaders that men do not think. There's a great book that Napoleon Hill wrote called Think and Grow Rich. And if you read past the first cover, you've read too much, he says, because the secret's right there on the front cover. Think. There's a great book by my friend John C. Maxwell. He won his leadership award two times in a row. I couldn't believe that. Yeah. But he's, you know, he's got a book called uh, Thinking for a Change. Right. That's a great book. If you're looking to buy a book right now and listen to it, buy all of Stacey's first, but then go buy John C. Maxwell's book thinking for a change. And I love that one. I told him that when I met him for the first time, I said, I love that one of all your famous books. I just think it's so important that we think. Yeah. And I don't think that we, I, I, dare I say the word, I don't think that we think. (laughs) 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 Maybe I'm wrong in my thinking. I don't know. But (laughs) the point is, is what are we thinking about? And so if you spend all your time with constant Fox news and CNN or whatever, you know, network you turn into or tune into, um, that can be draining. Yeah. If you want to be successful, if you want to be different than about 78% of Americans, then keep your cell phone away from your bed. And don't let that be the first thing you grab in the morning. 78 plus percent of us do that. The very first thing we do in the morning is we reach over and we grab our phones. Maybe it's to turn off the alarm, but automatically, boom, we're either on Facebook, Instagram, X, whatever platform you're on, Fox yeah. News, CNN, MSNBC, whatever it is, all of a sudden you're starting to pour all that into your mind. Is that the first thing you want to think about? Is, do you want to start comparing your life to others with like, like filters? Yeah. By the way, if you're watching reality television, I hate to break this news to your listeners, Stacy, but reality television isn't real. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to keep up with the Kardashians. Do you? I don't. You know, the thing is, is shut it off and go make news. You know, we're sitting here waiting and watching, living, watching other people live their dreams. And we're wondering why we're depressed. Yeah. Guess what? There's so much that's not real out there that uh, we just need to come to terms that, you know what? People's lives aren't as great as they're making them to look. And why am I so concerned with their lives? You know how a great life could turn out if I just started living mine? Exactly. And stopped worrying about uh, you know what's going on in the world and just focused a little bit on my little my little tribe, my yeah. family. Right. I'm I've been blessed with four sons, and uh, we didn't have what they have in yeah. their pockets. You know these little cell phones and these yeah. the ability to to like and send emojis and and do this little Snapchat weird face. You've seen the kids doing that yes. with the phones, like. 
and like, when I pull, like, these <laughs> and it's like, what are you doing? Like, I yeah. don't get it. Why would you, of all pictures, want to send the most unflattering picture of yourself to your friends? I guess it's for comic relief or something, but probably, you know, you, you know what I did one time? I saw my son doing that in the car and he didn't see me sneak around the car and uh, I position, I position, I photo bombed every one of his <laughs> Snapchats. <laughs> it's like, dad, <laughs> I'm a dad, you know, that's what dads do, but <laughs> They're facing things, the younger people, and I know you got a lot of young people that listen to you as well, and they're facing stuff that we didn't necessarily need to face or had to face, Yeah, and that is the social media. Suicide rates are up. You mm -hmm. look at our veterans, we're losing 22 veterans a day to suicide. Yeah. You see the depression rates going through the roof, and I think it's because, you know, we got, we've got all these people comparing their lives to others, and yeah. it's... And, and they're misjudging because they we only post things that make us look like amazing. Yes. Here I am. I'm guilty of it on Waikiki mm -hmm. Beach. And everybody yes. else that isn't there is going, man, my life sucks. <laughs> no, I was all by myself walking back, you know, alone to a hotel room. It was beautiful. Yes. But I was there to work. And sometimes it's just not as glamorous as we make it out to be because of the filters and the AI, you know, and getting rid of all the flaws mm -hmm. on our pictures is not as it seems. Yeah. And a lot is that in our minds, too, that it is not as it seems. If you're worried about, oh, I might mess up or I might do these things, then you're saying the wrong things to yourself. Yeah. What if we asked ourselves better questions? Because Andy Andrews, who, who wrote one of my favorite books called uh, The Traveler's Gift, he's a good friend of mine. He said, Nathan, the quality of our answers is determined by the quality of our questions. Yeah. Um, and so are we asking ourselves the right questions? Why am I so dumb? Uh, that's a bad, that's a stupid question. Yeah. What if, you know, what if it doesn't work? Here's a better question. What if it works? Right. Oh, yeah. You know, are we asking ourselves the right questions? And anyways, I'm doing too much talking here, but I just, Not I just all. wanted to talk about that today because I just came from lunch where... I met a grown man who is someone I've known for about 10 years. I met him at a conference where I was speaking and he took me to lunch today. And um, he is in a place in his life where he's trying to figure out life. Yeah. And aren't we all? Exactly. Yes, we are. He, he beats himself up and I told him, stop it, Charlie Brown. And uh, he didn't know what that meant till I told him the story about when I was cast as Charlie Brown in the North American tour of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. <laughs> I've just gotten off the road doing Joseph and the Amazing Technic of the Dreamcoat for two years, and now I'm cast in the lead role. Well, that's a lot of pressure, first of yeah. all. And yet, what a, what a compliment and how exciting it was. And I was like, I'm going to be the best Charlie Brown out there. And I was determined to get into that character. Yeah. So I went down and bought that yellow shirt with the black zigzag on it. I went to Hallmark. I bought this cardboard cutout of Charlie Brown out of their window on display, put it in my apartment. I started reading comic books with Charlie Brown. I went to the college. I got acting classes and I started working on really channeling my inner Charlie Brown. Yeah. I started putting paper bags on my head. I would say Good <laughs> everywhere I go. And everyone thought, well, there's Charlie Brown. And they're right. And I acted like him. And I just really tried my best to be the best Charlie Brown while learning the music, but more importantly, learning the character. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I started working on this one particular scene called The, the Doctor Is In. Yeah. Where Lucy tells Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown, you got to come out and talk about everything that's wrong with you. Right. She says. And he's like, so he does. So he starts singing this song. He says, I'm not very handsome or clever or lucid. I've always been stupid at spelling and numbers. I've never been much playing football or baseball or stickball or checkers or marbles or ping pong. I'm usually awful at parties and dances. I stand like a stick or I cough or I laugh or I don't bring a present or I spill the ice cream or I get so depressed that I stand and I scream. Oh, how could there possibly be one small person as thoroughly, totally, utterly blah as me? Ooh, if that doesn't make you feel sick. Yeah. It made me feel sick. Yeah. And I didn't know why I was feeling sick inside all the time and feeling this cloud I was walking around in and this depression and why I was failing math and all the things I had just been singing to the top of my lungs were happening to me. It's because I was attracting all that negativity into my yeah. life day after day in my yellow shirt with black zigzags saying, how could there possibly be one small person as thoroughly, totally, utterly blah as me? No wonder you're depressed. 
Yeah. But I didn't know why I was depressed until right. I got still, until I had to give myself a timeout, my little Grand Prix Pontiac. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in front of this, this beautiful temple where my parents had gotten married back in the seventies. And right. it was just a special place. We all have to have special places in our lives to get quiet and get still. Yeah. And um, so I was like sitting there and I was like, you know what? God, talk to me. Like, why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling? Yeah. And I had the most amazing spiritual experience. Now, whether you believe or not, I felt like I heard something coming from the passenger seat of my car. And it said to me, why don't you love yourself the way that I love you? Mm. And I was changed. Wow. Charlie Brown exited my life. I ended up not even doing the show. Did you know that that same year that 12 other shows came out and the top two buyers of our, of our tour changed their minds? Well, it not only shut down and you're a good man, Charlie Brown, it also shut down fame and he gets your gun and the sound of music that year. Wow. So all of that pain I put myself through for nothing. But you know what? I learned something in the process of preparing to be Charlie. And that was this. We all have a Charlie Brown in us. Yeah. We all have somebody within us that's saying, you're not very handsome or clever or loose is stupid, right? And we just, yeah. that person is, if we said half the stuff that Charlie Brown said to him, we, we, we'd be considered abusive. Right. And if we said those to other people, they would lock us up. So here's the point. Why are you saying them to you? Yeah. They're not true. Exactly. Be careful what you tell yourself because you just might believe it. I went and did something nice for myself that night. And maybe it was not the most healthy thing, but I bought me a milkshake. You know, I, <laughs> I started laughing more at my own dad jokes, right? I started like <laughs> not taking myself so seriously. And I became a real fun guy to hang out with. <laughs> and I started liking me more. And the thing is, is that a lot of times people that are lonely and this and that, you know, I think oftentimes they just, they, they really paint the worst picture of themselves, possibly mentally with their words. And we don't ever hear them, but we see it all over their face. Yeah. And so uh, many times in my life, I've had to remind myself of that Charlie Brown lesson I learned. And that is yeah. turn him off, get exactly. rid of that Charlie Brown, stop lying to yourself. You are a child of the most high God. And he yes. puts you on this planet right now at this time for a purpose. And you might not know what that purpose is yet. Right. It's okay. He knows. And just trust in that. Yeah. Go move your feet. See where he guides you. I don't know. I know this isn't a spiritual like podcast, but guess what? Let's let's take him to church today, Stacy. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's talk about yeah. mental health because it affects us. What we think about will affect you physiologically, even other people's thoughts. We did a yeah. test one time at this youth conference I was at, and we sent somebody out in the hallway. And the speaker that was on the stage says, Okay, now I'm gonna give you two thoughts. Okay, I'm gonna give you a positive thought and a negative thought. When this first person comes in here, we're going to think the negative. And that yeah. is like, oh, you're so stupid and ugly and all this. Just negative. Think negative. And then I want you to think the complete opposite. I want you to think, wow, you're an amazing person. I'm sending yeah. all this energy your way. Boom, boom, boom. Anyway, they tried to like do a strength test. And he said, okay, guys, number one. And everybody's thinking negative thoughts. This person's strength was like so weak. They couldn't hold their arm up as they're trying to push their arm down. All right, now, now guys, number two, with the same amount of pressure and strength, with a whole room full of people thinking, wow, you're an amazing person. Wow, you're incredible. Wow, you're a child of God. Boom, energy came into that arm of that young person going, Whoa. Now, whether it was just mental and trying to prove their strength on the second time around, or whether those words actually affected the person, they've yeah. done tests with words, with water. They've taken like negative words and written them on paper and put it on the glass and these ugly crystals grew. And then they put positive words on glass and like beautiful crystals grew. It's just, you know, the, one of my favorite books says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Yeah. Bam, he says, let there be light with one word. Bam, light came. Mm -hmm. Imagine the light you can manifest in your life if you just start manifesting and, and start predicting and producing and spitting out what's going to happen, pronouncing victory over your life. Yes. What could happen? There was a young boy named named uh, David, and he got yelled at by his brother because they're in the middle of a war. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you're supposed to be watching the sheep, bro. You know, when you're down here. Blah, I'm trying to put in, this is like how brothers talk. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But he's like, listen, 
I'm here. They got this Philistine over there named Goliath. And <laughs> he's going to kick our booties if we don't shut him down. And so like he gets these rocks. You've heard that. I'm just, you know, summarizing the story of my own. Yeah, words. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But he goes running towards this giant. And as he runs, if you go read that book, and I think you know which one I'm talking about, I he starts it. swinging it around and he starts pronouncing victory over what's going to happen. And guess what happened? It, everything he said, what would happen, happened. Yes. And it frightened a whole army mm -hmm. and they ran away from a little boy named David. Yeah. What if we became like David and started pronouncing victory over our performances? Yeah. Over our work, over our families, over our, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish in life. What if you start saying, I am the greatest Muhammad Ali. Heck, I got his signature right there. I sat on an airplane with him once. He mm -hmm. said he was, and guess what he became? The greatest. Right. Did he just like pretend he was the greatest? Maybe he was faking it. But guess what? He told himself that every day. And lo and behold, he becomes the greatest. Yeah. Michael Jordan, you know, gets cut from the basketball team in high school, goes home and cries. What if he just quit? Right. The thing is, is that there's so many famous failures. And if you've never failed, you've never tried anything. Exactly. So we want to encourage your listeners to go out and try something. Yeah. Give yourself some credit and like, you'll never know unless you try. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln who said that my concern is not whether you have failed, but whether you are content with mm -hmm. your failure. Exactly. Wow. So yeah. fail your way to success, but give yourself some credit. You know, there's a guy named, um, uh, it's Tony Schwartz. He wrote this book with Michael Eisner. He wrote one with Donald Trump called Art of the Deal. And I got to introduce him on stage one time. And he said something to me after the presentation. He says, Nathan, I train a lot of athletes, you know, and they come and they work with me, especially tennis players. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know what I do with my tennis players? If they ever hit a lousy shot, I say, pop that chest out. Boom, walk back like a champ like you just scored. Mm -hmm. And physiologically, even though they know they just lost a point, right? And they're just right. like, dang it. Instead of walking back with their shoulders down, pop that chest out. You walk back like you are Muhammad Ali. Be the greatest in your mind first. Yes. Because if you can't first believe it up here, how can you achieve it out there? Exactly. So you just look at the Boston Red Sox for 86 years who believe that they played under a curse. How are you going to play if you walk into the office believing you're cursed? Exactly. Right? Uh, and everybody's better than me and I don't have any original ideas. Well, then th 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 there you just manifested what you just said. Exactly. So stop it, Charlie Brown. Turn them off. You know what? And start thinking like a champ. Because you will become what you think about most of the time. It was Earl Nightingale who wrote that. He it actually was a recording. It was a gold record. Earl Nightingale is the one that came up with what's called The Strangest Secret. And he says that you become what you think about most of the time. Well, then you had Rhonda Byrne in her book, The Secret. They all call them secrets. Ogmandino, the greatest secret. No, it's not a secret. One of my favorite books is, as a man thinketh, so is he, or so shall he be. And that book's been out a long time. Yeah. So guys, go read some of these books. But the point is, is it all comes down to what we tell ourselves. Right. And uh, we got to first believe it to achieve it. So start with believing. Oh, Don't stop believing, Journey, right? <laughs> we got to kick the music <laughs> in now. I know, right? Don't stop. stop oh, what a great song. Believing. The number one most requested karaoke <laughs> song of all time is that yes. one right there. Isn't that it so is. good? Great tune. <laughs> well, listen, I've been doing all the talking. Uh, like you, you help people, Stacy, with with their mental health and positivity and their, their gratitude journals and everything else that you do with all your 20 plus books. You know, you overcome epilepsy. Like what what went through your mind when you first told that you were epileptic? For years, I kept it. I kept it a secret. I, well, you know, yeah. I was because when I when I grew up, it was it, there was a lot of stigmatism. There's still stigmatism out there, but mm -hmm. when I grew up, there was a ton of stigmatism, and I didn't want to be judged by others. And I, mm -hmm. I so called wanted to be the norm. I wanted to be looked at like everybody else. I didn't want people to think that I was lesser of what I was because mm -hmm. I had this disorder. So I kept it quiet for many years, but, you know, I was still having seizures in school, but I was the cl class clown and, you know, I, everyone liked me and I was easygoing. So people didn't really, you know, I, I still got invited to, you know, people's houses and parties and, you know, people liked me and, you know, yep. so it didn't have like a huge impact, but it was emotionally, it was very embarrassing. It was humiliating for me. It was scary. You know, I was put into a lot of scary situations when I would have seizures 
And, yeah. you know, growing up wasn't easy. It was like a roller coaster ride and, tr you know, trying to find that right medication, that right, you know, solution. And, and, you know, it was, it was really difficult. And, you know, I, it was, um, you know, I came out, you know, later on in life, to be honest with you, it got to a yeah. point where, you know, I realized that when I started to help myself in college, when my, my seizures were at, at its probably all time high is when the, mm -hmm. the late night study in the trying to get the good grades, you know, my, my seizures just went through the roof. And like I was telling you earlier, I had a goal. I had a bucket list. I wanted to finish school. I wanted to get a college degree. It was like an accomplishment for me. Yeah. And I got up to a point where I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it. And, you know, I, I was able to, you know, reach out and to the epilepsy foundation. They had a magazine back then, back then they actually had magazines, you know, oh. I just, <laughs> <laughs> what are those wrote, nowadays? Yeah, yeah. I wrote a letter to the magazine, to the editor, and I asked them to publish this letter for me. And I asked people, how do you cope with epilepsy? And mm. like, I was telling you like three to 400 letters all over the United States came to my house, you know, from United States and Canada. And it was yeah. such an inspiration. I felt like I wasn't alone for the first time in my life. I, I felt like I wasn't fighting it by myself. And, and then I started, I said, one, you know, I created a regiment from, and they motivated me. And I, I went by that regiment, you know, from all the advice I got finished school. Yeah. I got, I got into, you know, later years, I, you know, I, I realized, you know, I, I, I was going to write a book called epilepsy. You're not alone. Cause I figured yeah. that was the perfect title epilepsy. You're not alone. And, uh, you know, when, after I wrote that book, um, I got a letter, like I was telling you in my email box and the person said I was on the verge of suicide. I found your book in Barnes and Nobles and you, I just want to let you know, you saved my life. And yeah. that was when I realized how important the words of wisdom was and how important it was for me to mm -hmm. voice my story, to tell people that it was okay, that, yeah. you know, that, you know, there's a solution to every, every crisis, there is a solution and we shall get through it. I love that. Well, you know, I like that you talked about how you tried to hide it. Yeah. And that is so normal for anyone that's ever experienced anything like a diagnosis of any sort in your life that you were just embarrassed about. It reminds me a lot of my own father, mm -hmm. Alan Osmond, the oldest of the original Osmond brothers is my dad. So I'll just get that out of the way because when people hear Osmond, they're like, who's your daddy, right? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? <laughs> Alan. Alan's my father. And he was diagnosed when I was 10 years old. So it was 1987. He was diagnosed with something called multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. They didn't know much about it. MS, he says it stands for many sons. He's got eight of us. There's eight boys in our family. But he, <laughs> he said <laughs> on day one, he says, guys, I might have MS, but MS does not have me. Oh, I like I'm not going to die. I'm not going to, I might end up in a wheelchair, but the thing is, as long as I have your love and your mother's love, we're going to get through this, right? I'm going to need your help. But anyways, the attitude, I might have MS, but MS does not have me. He went on the Larry King show and he says, Larry is not the disease that gets you. And before he did that, I just rewind. Let me rewind before he goes on Larry King, because he, like you kept it secret. Yeah. He didn't want people to know, right? Maybe it was pride. Maybe it was just the unknown. He didn't want pity, whatever it was. Yeah. But he kept it in. And so finally, you know, people are saying, hey, why is your dad limping? Oh, he hurt his leg. We made up stories, right? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until we lived in Branson, Missouri, we were on the Jerry Lewis telethon that my father finally let down his guard and his pride. And he says, as they're singing, he's my brother on this national television broadcast. He says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, reach in your pockets, re open up your, your hearts and, and do what you can to give to Jerry's kids today. Because when you help people with MD, you're also helping people with MS like me yeah. and what tears. Yeah. It was the first time. And he did it in a massive scale on national television. Wow. He tells everybody he's got MS and just cries and they, he's my brother. And they end it. Right. So powerful. Well, he gets a phone call shortly after from the Star Magazine, who says, Alan, we understand you have MS. Uh, you're going to give us an exclusive on your story, or we're going to write our own. They basically wow. threatened him. And this is what he says, guys, I'm on the other line. Let me call you right back. Takes down their number. He wasn't on the other line, but he called Annette Funicello from the Mickey Mouse Club, who also he knew had MS, and they were friends as kids. Okay. And he reaches out to her and says, Annette, this is why I kept it in for so long. Yeah. I don't want pity. I don't want to say Alan facing death and all this garbage. Yeah. And he was angry. 
And, he, and what do I do? And he goes, she says, just come out and talk about it. Yeah. Best thing I ever did. And so he says, okay, I'll do it. And so he calls back this magazine and he says, listen, guys, come on up to our cabin in Fairview, Utah. Let's give you that. Let's give you that really cool you know, interview. And so they did. Well, what they didn't know is that the very next day, Bob Goen from Entertainment Tonight was in our front living room with the cameras. And so was A Current Affair and all these TV shows. Well, before the print could ever hit the print, guess what? The story was already out on Entertainment Tonight in A Current Affair. And oh, they wow. called my father up and they said, you scooped us. And he says, <laughs> Don't you ever threaten my family again. Click. <laughs> you know, uh, they got a taste of their it. own medicine. Exactly. And so, you know what happened? Just like your letters, people who didn't even know my dad said, Hey, have you considered this remedy? Have you thought, thought about this or bee stings or Capaxone or all the people started praying for my father yeah. that beforehand. Didn't even know he was dealing with that. Right. It's when we open up and we become vulnerable yeah. and we let our pride go and we say, you know what? I'm facing something. I might have epilepsy, but it does not have me. Exactly. Whatever the condition is, that's the way you took it. And look at all the people that came out of the woodworks to try and help Stacy, you right. know, and that's what can happen to you. One of my favorite books says you have not because you ask not. A lot of people hit speed bumps and yeah. they pull over to the side of the road and they don't do anything about it. They don't even put on their hazard lights, letting people know I need help. Right. Because whether that's pride or whatever it is, they don't want pity, whatever it is, maybe it's fear. Yeah. Maybe it's judgment, right? They're feeling, whatever it is, just be willing to ask for help. Exactly. If you need it. And we all need it from time to time, right? Oh, hundred percent. You, you know what it is, is it ego and ego is, 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 your, is a, a touch of low self-esteem. And it's that, that feeling of, of fear. It's, it's everything combined. It's that mm -hmm. fear of what people are going to think about you. And if you worry about what people think about you, then that means you have an issue with low self-esteem and, mm. you know, and you have to play. That's when people put on that ego, they put on that yeah fake persona that that person over them and you know what also too is like a lot of people are in denial they think you know okay you know if i don't if, if i don't come to terms with it and i make believe i don't have it then i don't have to deal with it but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't go away you know <laughs> it's like you know so but, but people try to be in denial like i remember when my mother was you, you know she when i was a kid she'd go they used to have that really in the, in this, in the city, they used to have like a community pool and it had the highest diving board on the community pool. And my yeah. mother would say, don't go off the diving board. Well, I'd run to that diving board as fast as I could. And I'd make sure I <laughs> hop off of it. First thing, the, as soon as she told me I couldn't go on it, I was there, you yes. know, Nathan and anyone told me, I was like, I have to prove I can do it. And that was the go. mentality, you know, that there, there you go. It's funny that you brought that up. They they pretend they don't have it, then they don't have it. It reminds me of what about Bob? Remember when he like starts yell, yelling all those terrible things at that kid and he starts yelling back because they pretend like they don't have you yeah. know threats. Mm -hmm. You know, if I pretend I don't have it, then I if I pretend I have it, then I don't really have it because I'm just pretending. Yeah. It's it's interesting. There's the mind does some funny things. And I love to watch humans. I love to be a people watcher. Yeah. You know, because you if you want some free entertainment, go sit at the mall. <laughs> for 10 minutes on a bench and just watch go to new york city times square you're going to see every walk of life yes in that little area right there mm -hmm. and it's just it's so entertaining but you start to notice things with people too you start to notice the people whose shoulders are shrugged and the people that are just they want to just tune out the world and they're just walking i mean look at these girls that are getting punched in the face because they're looking oh my at their god yeah how horrible is that by the way stop it if you're watching out there don't yeah. hit women right don't hit anybody but the point yeah. is is that you notice that, they're, that we're all growing through things. Right. If we're all going places and heading here. I always ask that question. Where's that guy going? Yeah. Where's that girl going? Mm -hmm. You know, we're all heading from one point to another. Yeah. Just, I just, my mind goes there and I love to watch and I love to see how people dress. I love to see like the different cultures and I love to see, you know, uh, I was just in Hawaii this last week and I saw this homeless guy just yelling at everybody. I'm like, what went, what did he go through to get to that point? Yeah. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in Hawaii and I spent, uh, I did a show over there and it was so cool because we do a lot of guerrilla marketing. I'd be out on the streets and I knew everybody from, uh, you know, the, the entertainers and the street vendors, they were street walkers. I didn't talk yeah. to them very much. Right. But I knew who everybody was. Right. And 
And then the I was finishing up the show. I was about ready to come back to the mainland. And the Aloha Joe television starts walking with me down Kalakaua, which is that main strip right there by Waikiki Beach, where I just was. Yeah. And there, and I start, hey, this is so-and-so. He makes these great bracelets and sells all these up here. Oh, this is so-and-so. He's a great entertainer. They put on a great show out here every night. Oh, the, you know, and, and all of a sudden, while I'm introducing all these people on the street. Yeah. Nathan, right? This homeless man comes running up to me. I said, Alan, <laughs> you know the homeless people too? I said, yes. And he was like, so, and like, are we on television? He took off this Miley Lay, puts it on my neck. If my daughter's watching, I just want to tell you, I love you. He starts Aww. crying and, oh, and Aloha Joe Television's like, how do you know everybody? I said, that's because I spend time out here. I notice people, I talk to people. Yeah. Well, you know, I gave cookies to a homeless woman one night who was sitting on a, you know, a picnic table there on the beach. Right. And I was like, you know, I just, I, if we don't take time to notice yeah, others, if we're so caught up in ourselves yeah, and that's easy in the entertainment world, mm -hmm. a lot of people think even my own wife says, you're a narcissist. I said, am I, it, am I, I said, listen, I, the reason you see my face on everything is because I'm selling this product. Yeah. Okay? And I know it comes off at th that way sometimes. And I'm sorry that you feel that way. Right. If I were selling toilets, all you'd see are toilets. Yeah. Now that I'm a mortgage guy, she gets it. Because all she hears about is Osmond Home Loans. I don't know if I'm <laughs> People housing lender, right? So <laughs> it's we're all selling something. But the point is, is that notice people. Don't make it all about you. And that's something I learned because entertainment, it's all about you. It's all yeah. about your new single. It's about your new movie. It's about whatever it is. And I get you can get caught up in your own press release. Yeah. Stop buying your own press. Exactly. You're not as, you know, none, none of us are as cool as we make ourselves to look on social media. So just, just be real, be authentic. Yeah. And I think the younger generation has now figured this out. You know, the older generation was very, ta-da, you know, yeah. but it's now like, hey, how you doing? What's up? You know, it's right. like they love realness. Like they love when you, when you're not, when you don't have your sale shoes on, the tap shoes. Yeah. They just, just, let's just talk. Right. Let's just chill, man. You know, that's fire. They have this whole new language they say to us, these young people. Yeah. And I love the young people because they're up against a lot of stuff they don't even realize they're up against because it's just normal. Right. Like they were born with social media in their lives, with cell phones and wireless internet and yeah. all this stuff that none of us had. And we didn't have cell phones. I remember coming home from my <laughs> mission and it got, got me a beeper. And kids are like, what is that? You know? <laughs> Isn't it weird that they all want to be us now? Like the clothing's coming back and they all want like record players. So they yep. all want, even cassettes and VHSs are coming back. You're like, <laughs> what is, is this the twilight zone? I thought it all we like, circulates. <laughs> oh man, I should have held on to my stuff. I but know, anyways, right? <laughs> but I just love that they're, they're figuring it out too. And if you're dealing, if you're a young person, by the way, and you have parents that you just think are not cool and you just don't gel with them or whatever, give them a break. Yeah. You know, that they've never been parents before. This is the first time they're just trying to figure it out. Right. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we make mistakes too as yeah. parents and we don't, you know, maybe we reprimand differently than others and whatever it is, just know that your, your mom and dad are not Superman or right. Superwoman. And the day you realize that, I think you give them a break. Yeah. Because guess what? You aren't either. Right. But you know what? We do have greatness within us. We just have to awaken it, like our friend Tony Robbins says, right? Yeah. I love his Awaken the Giant Within title. Mm -hmm. I worked with Tony a bunch on stage. And I just tell you, I people, we were just talking about this the other day. You know that he warms himself up before he goes out on stage, just like an entertainer, just like a, a singer or an athlete. Tony yeah. Robbins has a little trampoline backstage. Boom, boom, he just jumped. He's a whole regimen he goes through. I saw him do this little spin around kick, and then he's boom, he slaps his chest and he walks through his physicality. He he channels and he, he what's the word? Conditions himself yeah. to get out there and do everything you see he does. But even he warms up, even he has coaching, even yeah. he hires people that inspire him. You know, because the thing is, is that we've all learned from others. Yeah. And I learned something one time, Stacy, when I was about ready to introduce uh, my friend, Brian Tracy. And I said to Brian, Brian, I'm going to be uh, emceeing and speaking at this five-day real estate training. And I wanted to use this quote of yours from your 21 Secrets of Self-Made Millionaires. Would you mind if I use this quote? You know what he told me? Nathan, you can use all my stuff and never even give me credit. 
<laughs> I thought, what? He goes, let me teach you something. He says in Ecclesiastes, it says there's nothing new under the sun. Yep. Where do you think we got it? Mm -hmm. And the people that we got it from, where do you think they got it? Exactly. In a hundred years from now, people are going to be starving for the same stuff because guess what? It's truth and truth never goes out of style. So feel free to use all my stuff and never even give me credit. Well, I said, well, I will give you credit, but he taught me something. Yeah. We've all learned from others we did. and we should continue to learn from others because if we think we've got it all figured out, there's a great bumper sticker that says hire a teenager while they still know everything. <laughs> <You know? laughs> None of us have all the answers. So exactly. be humble enough to listen and learn. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Stacy. Stacey, I've been talking too much. <laughs> no, you're not. This is amazing. You, you said so many amazing things. You've tapped onto um, so many important topics. You know, I don't even know where to begin. You know, like the one thing that like I loved was about the labelism. You know, like we, mm -hmm. you know, if you took if you took a person and you striped away all their responsibilities, who is that person? You know, yeah. think, you know, you think about someone who's maybe a working person and they have a job and they're a mm -hmm. mom and they're this and they're that and you know. And they're head yeah. of the bowling league and they're doing this. And, you know, there are all these different things. And then one day there's no more bowling league. And then one day they don't mm -hmm. have to work anymore. Or, you know, or one day their kids are out of the house and they're all going to college. Who is that person? Who mm -hmm. are you? I said that to one person one time. I said, you know, if you had to take away this, 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 the grandkids and this and this and this and this. I said, who is the real Dolores? And she mm. said, she had to think because I don't think she really knew mm -hmm. who that real person was because she mm -hmm. was so wrapped in her family and her responsibilities and her work that if you took all those things away from her, mm. what qualities and characteristics really underlie that person? Who is that person? Not who what people are telling person? that who they have to be, not, you mm -hmm. know, not the role of grandma, not the role of, you know, wife and not mm -hmm. the, all those other things, but who is that person? What does she like? What does she crave? What's her purpose? You know, besides all those yeah. other things, you know, what mm -hmm. deep downside does she really want to be? And mm -hmm. I don't think she knew the answer, you know? And None of us have it all figured out. And the thing is, is, Oftentimes we don't know how to be ourselves. Yeah. It's like Les Brown. You've all heard of him. Great motivational speaker. If you haven't heard of Les Brown, you've got to go look up Les Brown. Yeah. But he told me something once. He says, Nathan, I had my own TV show, a talk show. And it was day one. It was our very first taping. I had a live audience there in the studio. And my manager got it all clapping. They're all ready for me and ready. Action. In the clap. And then the dies down. And Les is sitting there and he's like not saying anything. And his manager's coach is like, come on, Les. And he's just like, you could tell he was something was, he was struggling. What, was he having a stroke? What's going on here? He's like, Les, <laughs> just be yourself. Yeah. And he said out loud to his manager that day, he goes, how do I do that? Right. And the manager says, cut. Come with me, Les. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. And he walks him outside the studio and had his little pep talk. But he thought, wow, I didn't even know how to be Les Brown. Right. I didn't know about who I was in that moment. Yeah. And so if you don't know who you are, make that your journey this year. Mm -hmm. Like start discovering who you are. Yeah. When I was asked that question last night from Elder Garrett W. Gong, tell me about Nathan. Yeah. When someone of that caliber says, tell me about Nathan. Yeah. Wow. Made me think that, you know, even God, the greatest of all, who designed me in his image right probably asked me that same question yeah because guess what he knows my name yes and when i start to realize my infinite value yeah that i'm never told about in school or in my work in my jobs i'm yeah. never told that by who i am or who of whose i am yeah you know don't be proud of who you are be proud of whose you are think right. about that for a minute let that yeah. just make your day and start with that, but then start asking yourself the right questions. Who are you? Yeah. Who are you really? You know, yeah. what makes you happy inside? Exactly. What brings you joy? Like ask real questions and be honest. Right. Because guess what? You are not perfect. So stop beating yourself up. 
love yourself enough to say, you know what? I'm not where I want to be yet, but guess yeah. what? I'm on my way. Right. I love this book called One Word That Will Change Your Life. And I read it every January 1st. It's like this thick. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. And it just challenges the reader to look in, inward, outward, and upward when picking out the theme of the year. And you like pick that. one word. I chose relationships two years ago. Last year, I chose nurture as my word to nurture those relationships. Guess what word I chose this year? What word? Abundance. I like oh, that. And it took me two and a half months to come up with the right word. But it has just resonated with me. Now I'm hearing it everywhere I go. Isn't that interesting? Like if you've ever just bought like a new pair of jeans or a new car or anything like that, you notice that you start noticing that everybody else is driving the same car and wearing yeah. the same jean because mm -hmm. now your mind is thinking about that. Yes. If I think, if I start thinking about abundance, yeah. what am I going to attract into my life? Right. And I just ordered me a big glass thing off of Etsy and it says abundance. Usually like people it. put their names there for their desk. I said, no, no, yeah. no, no abundance. And then in my little tagline, instead of my little job title, I said, good things are coming my way. Oh, you know I what I say? It. I look myself in the mirror and I say to myself constantly, it says day by day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Imagine if you have cancer right now and you start saying that to yourself. Oh yeah. Day by day in every way, I'm getting better and better. I have epilepsy day by day in every way I'm getting better and better. Yes. If you start manifesting just like that David with a slingshot, bam, guess what? You start knocking out the giants in your life because you start manifesting and pronouncing victory over your life. Exactly. Words are powerful and they affect they you in every way, physically, mentally, spiritually, socially. Be careful with what you say yes. and be careful what you think because you might believe it. You know, and I, that's so true. And you think about even like the law of attraction, whatever you put, the mind is a powerful tool. And, you know, if you think about it, the whole world is run by energy. That if we mm -hmm. didn't have energy, there would be no world. You know, we are run by energy as human beings. And mm -hmm. you know, if we think positive, if we put out that positive energy, positive things will come back. If we Absolutely. put out negative energy, you're going to start seeing negativity around. You're going to see mm -hmm. negative people start to draw to you. And it's the energies, that the mindset, the way we think, the way we react, the way we do. We draw those people. We draw those situations to us. So if you want to succeed, then you have to think successful thoughts. If you want to, you know, if you want to elevate to the next level, then you have to think about, you know, about your strength and your resilience. And you have to really think about who you are as a person and take all that labelism out and who you are, where you want to be and what you want to accomplish and then start figuring out a plan, you know, mm -hmm. and set that plan down maybe on paper because we are, we are who we think we are. And we, we draw, if we look at the word abundance and we have that in front of us, by golly, we're going to have abundance, you know, mm -hmm. and that's absolutely, how we have to, you know, focus in, and think about it like that. Because most of us have a scarcity mindset. Imagine yeah. if you had an abundance mindset that there's yeah. plenty for all, then you wouldn't hoard all your contacts and not, that's, that's my friend. Hey, you stay away from them. And I'm, a, yeah. hey, I'm working with that real time. I'm more of I've been working, trying to market to that person for years. Stop it. Yes. You know what? Stop it. You know how many people are out there that want your business? If you just act, act the part. Yes. And if you're a person that's wrapped up in their own self, it makes a very small package. Yes. I noticed that my, my hero back here, Jesus, you mm -hmm. know, he always has his hands like this. Yeah. He's always open. That's how I want to live my life. Exactly. Abundantly. I've got plenty for all. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he took sure. a few loaves and fishes and he felt he fed the multitude. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Was that a miracle? Yeah. He turned water into wine. Guess what you can do with your life? He says, you're going to do greater things than I did. Yeah. And he said it. Well, I, that's very daunting. And I don't know, you know, I doubt myself, my mustard seed isn't that big. So I'm like, well, you know what? I probably need to believe a little bit more. I told this man at lunch today, I said, I told the Lord one time and my son, I thought had leukemia. I, I handed over my faith to the Lord. I said, help thou mine unbelief. Just like that father of old. He says, all things are possible if you can just believe. Yes. Oh Lord, I believe this, really? And then he says, he humbles himself. He says, help thou mine unbelief. Mm -hmm. So if you're a doubter, stop it. Yeah. If you're a Charlie Brown, stop it. Yeah. If you're an abuser, stop it. And mm -hmm. I mean not only others, but especially yourself. Stop beating yourself up. Yes. Just love yourself enough to go live your life to the best of your ability. Start laughing at jokes and start start not taking yourself so seriously. Yeah. It's important to be serious from time to time. Right. But at the same time, people want to be around who? The serious guy? Or do they want to be around the fun guy? 
The you know, people guy. call me mushroom because yeah. I'm a real fun guy. But uh, <laughs> that's a bad joke. Anyways, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but I love history, Stacy, And I love this one story because I was just in Dearborn, Michigan, and I went to the Henry Ford Museum. And I love Henry Ford and what he was able to accomplish in his life. But I love this story because there was a guy driving his car and he had some problems with the engine. Something started acting up. So he pulls over to the side of the road. And he gets out, he pops the hood, he starts working on it. He's just frustrated. I don't have time for this. And he's mad and he's angry and he's all by himself. Well, while he's not even, you know, he's caught up in himself and his problems, this nice black limousine pulls up behind him and the driver gets out, opens the door. And this nice looking gentleman in a long coat gets out and he walks up to the man. He goes, what seems to be the problem? He says, I have no idea. Just stop working and I'm just frustrated. He says, you mind if I take a look at it? He says, have a go, you know, good luck. This man in the nice long coat goes like this and like this. He says, all right, now go try it. <laughs> that kicks in. Wow. He goes, wow, how, what'd you do? How'd you do that? And the nice looking man looks at this frustrated man. He says, well, you see, sir, my name is Henry Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I designed this vehicle. I built it. <laughs> and it does my heart a great disservice to see it sitting off on the side of the road, not doing what it was born to do. Oh, wow. You think that our creator from time to time, wh whoever you call him, you think that he looks at us sometimes and just sees us sitting off on the side of the road, not doing what we were born to do. And what, a, how that must be so disheartening to his heart. Oh yeah. To see his very own creature created in his image, sitting there, not doing what we or he, he or she were born to do. Right. So I love that metaphor, that story, because it's a true story. And Cool thing is, is that we need to take these lessons from today's show and apply them and yeah. ask ourselves the right question. Tell me about Stacy. Mm -hmm. Tell me about feeling your name and really come to know and get, make a friend with the person in the mirror. Yeah. No, I'm not saying be all caught up in yourself, but at the same time, start loving yourself a little more. Exactly. If you're a Charlie Brown, stop it. Yeah. Right. Because the curtain goes down and guess what? The yellow shirt gets hung up and guess what? You may not even get the tour exactly well, the point is stop being someone else you see like at the super bowl this year all these guys with these guys jerseys you know with the name of somebody else kelsey whoever it was yeah. screaming their guts out and they couldn't even talk at work the next day because they're so hoarse because i was yelling so much right if they had half that passion for their own life started wearing their own last name on the back of their jersey yeah what if you had half that passion for you oh and 100%. your family and yeah. your hobbies and your work yeah. Imagine the good you could do this year. If you 100%. walked around with abundance floating around in front of you every day, looking at the little tagline, good things are coming my way day by day in every way I'm getting better and better. Imagine if you started saying things like that. Yeah. If you started going towards your Goliaths with a stone in hand saying, hey, you're mine I and you it. are going down right? I'm yelling timber pit bull. Here's the point. Get in the game because players play and spectators buy tickets. Yes. What I do you want to be? <laughs> be a player. You want to be Woo! a player. Yes, you there do. There you go. <laughs> you do. Oh, well, this sure. has been fun to be on your show. My goodness. I'm so grateful for the invite. And oh, you're uh, welcome. It's so been glad we connected. Yes. You know, it's been an honor to have you on the show, Nathan. I, I loved having you on the show. You are Thank an amazing you. person. And I Thank just, I, I really admire everything you've accomplished and just your, the, your way of thinking and your way of living is so inspirational and so motivational. And, and, you know, you had such powerful things to say and, and so meaningful. And I, I hope the listeners today pick up on a lot of the things that you said and really, you know, you know, kind of incorporate it into their own lives because, you know, you had, you, made a, a ton of great points today and you know we, we are in a world that is so wrapped up in what everyone else is doing and we are focusing on the the negative instead of the positive let's focus on ourselves let's focus on the things that mean the most let's have gratitude let's have love let's really focus on on what matters because we're here you know we never know what the next day may bring so let's make today matter and let's make the best out of it and i think after i get off this this radio show with you i think i'm going to go order go on etsy and i'm going to order a little sign that says abundance <laughs> <laughs> i'm going to find out where you got it let's attract gonna... it into our lives you know yeah i love oh. it i love it <laughs> we need reminders daily 
as yeah. to who we are and whose we are. And we also need to attract into our lives that what we which we truly want. Yes. And uh, you know, whether that your your word for the year is abundance or relationships or or money or life or friendship. Yeah. You know, this guy I just had lunch with, he says, that's the thing I'm looking for. I'm just looking for a friend. Yeah. And I thought, wow. I said, we all need a safe person. I'm yours. Yeah. Let's go to uh -huh. lunch again. You know, I love it. and if we just help one person today, yeah. and, if, and even if that one person is yourself, yes. if you can go to bed tonight, laying your head down and said, you know what? I made a difference in someone's life. Yes. And even if you have to be selfish once in a while and take a little time out and do a little self soothing and do a little bit of breathing, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of self-talk. Yeah. If you need to sneak a time out and listen to Stacy in her wonderful podcast here, you know, if you just need to get on YouTube and watch this video again and again, until you start saying day by day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Yeah. And I'm going to bless lives along the way. You know, it is not about us. You know, you just complimented me and I thank you. But you know how many people came into my life that taught me these things? Yeah. I want to give them some credit for right now. I, I want to say that. thank you to the teachers I've had. Because guess what? If I just kept it to myself, no. What yeah. good is our knowledge and talents and skill sets if we just keep them to ourselves? Exactly. Spread yourself out. Like yes. share you with the world. And the yes. beautiful part is my grandmother, her name was Olive, and uh, she started the Children's Miracle Network. Mm -hmm. It's raised over $7 billion for children's hospitals across, around the world. Well, guess what? She had a stroke and she went into a coma and she had a tracheotomy, so she couldn't even talk. And my father was sitting by her bedside. This is when she's on her deathbed. And, yeah. and uh, she, she came out of this coma and she like reaches and taps him on the hand. And she couldn't talk. And she pointed to this paper and this pencil. She wanted to write something down. And we have this letter in her own handwriting. And she says, Alan, that's my daddy. And she says, Alan, there is no limit to the good we can do if we don't care who gets the credit. Wow. And that's how she lived her life. Most people don't know this little lady born in a little two-bedroom cabin in Idaho, raised over $7 billion for children. But wow. that's the point. It's not about us. It used to be called Osmond Foundation for Children of the World. She changed the name to Children's Miracle Network because it's not about the Osmonds. It's about the right. kids. Right. And so if we just kind of like made our mission each day to just leave a part of us in different parts of the world and just say, Hey, how can I bless that person? How can I change this guy? You know, who I just had lunch with, how yeah. can I help this lady cross the street? What else can I do? Who else can I serve? It says in one of my favorite books, the greatest in our king, my kingdom will be your servant. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with serving others. No. And if we just forget ourselves, we'll find ourselves. Exactly. So if you don't know who you are, start serving. Start yeah. doing a charity. Charity never faileth. So if you want to be a winner, be a, be a charitable person. Oh, 100%. Give. Like that little song says, give a little bit, right? Yes. And the wise man once said this. He says, no man makes a greater mistake than he who gives nothing because he could give so little. Well, listen, a little bit from a lot of people is a ton. So if all of us listening today just made our mission to go out and do one act of random kindness today, imagine how much better the world will be today. Right. And how that will influence tomorrow. Because yeah. those people will remember that act. And then maybe they'll be inspired to go do it. It's yeah. like that butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. You know, the butterfly effect, my friend Andy Andrews taught me about this. It was a doctoral thesis in 1963, to be exact, in the New York Academy of Sciences, stating that butterflies on the other part of the, the other side of the world could flap their butterfly wings, which would move air molecules, which would then move more air molecules until it got to the other side of the world. It could literally create a massive storm butterflies. It was silly. It was stupid, but it was ridiculous, right? They thought, but it was interesting. Yeah. So it stuck around. And then after further research into the butterfly effect, scientists realized that it was very viable and it worked every single time. They even gave it the status of a law, mm -hmm. just like the law of gravity. The butterfly effect is known as the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions, the mm -hmm. butterfly effect. And they found out that not only does it work with butterflies, but it works with every form of moving matter, including humans. Wow. And so Andy told me this. I asked him if I could share this. And he says, absolutely, Nathan, pass it on. And he says, uh, one night he was in the room ironing his shirt and, and on the television on the other side of the room, you know, he could hear this, the person of the week, Peter Jennings was saying, the person of the week for this week is Norman Borlaug. And he's like, Norman, what? And he puts down his iron. He runs in the other room. He's like, Norman Borlaug. He didn't even know the guy was even still alive. <laughs> Norman Borlaug, 90 some odd year old, was being recognized as person of the week for saving all the, the lives of over 2 billion people and counting. 
And he says, oh, gosh, because he'd hybridized a certain type of corn and wheat that was planted in arid countries like Siberia and the plains of Africa and South oh, okay. America and had been credited for saving the lives of over two billion people. But this made Andy upset because he's a historian. He goes, I knew it wasn't Norman Borlaug that saved the lives of two billion people. Uh, -uh It was the vice president. Mm. Henry Wallace under Roosevelt. Some of you thinking, well, I thought I thought you know Truman was his vice president. Well, listen, if you're a historian, you know he had more than one VP. Yeah. And the first vice president that Truman had or Roosevelt had was a guy named Henry Wallace. And when Henry Wallace had that power and position of vice president, he went down to Mexico and set up a post with the sole intent of hybridizing corn and wheat to wow. be planted in arid countries. And he hired a young Norman Borlaug to run that post. So if you stop uh, and think about it, wasn't it truly uh, the Henry Wallace to save those lives? Yes. Mm -hmm. Unless perhaps maybe, just maybe it was George Washington Carver. And if you like barbecue sauce and peanut butter and whatever, he created more products out of the peanut and the sweet <laughs> potato, right? And, and so, crazy thing is, though, when he was a young, you know, college student at Iowa State University, you know, he had this dairy sciences professor that would send him out on these botanical expeditions on Saturdays and Sundays. And he'd go out and, and he'd let his little nine-year-old son go with him. And it just, you know, while he's flapping his butterfly wings on peanuts and sweet potatoes and on the Victory Garden that fed half our country during World War II, guess yeah. what? When nobody's looking, he's flapping his butterfly wings into the heart of a young Henry Wallace, mm -hmm. teaching this little nine-year-old Henry Wallace what plants can do and the lives that they can save. So if I think about it, I'm thinking George Washington Carver for person of yeah. the week. Mm -hmm. Didn't he really save the lives of two billion people? Unless maybe, Stacy, maybe it was just that little diamond Missouri farmer. You yeah. know, this guy that lived, uh, yeah, he lived in uh, this little state that didn't believe in, that believed in slavery and they didn't. Moses was his name. <laughs> and uh, his wife, Susan, they had this farm. And these weird radicals like Quantrill's Raiders would come in, they shoot people and steal horses and light the barns on fire. Oh, wow. And one day they came on his property and they did that to him. And they saw this lady named Mary who refused to give up her little baby. And so they just took Mary and her baby and rode off. Well, this was distraught. You know, Susan was distraught because Mary was her best friend. Yeah. And so instead of just crying about it, Moses took action and he put a poster over here, an inquiry over here. And three days later was actually able to line up a, a meeting with an offshoot group of Quanchill's Raiders in a little crossroads in Kansas in the middle of a January night. Oh, wow. And these guys come riding up with their burlap sacks over their heads and the horses. And and uh, Moses traded his only horse that he had left for what wow. they threw to him in a bag. And they ride off in the night. Well, Moses gets down on his hands and knees and he opens up this frozen, almost dead baby boy out of this bag. Oh, wow. And he opens up his shirt and he stuffs that baby in next to his skin. And he walked that baby out talking to him because he knew his mother had already been killed. Mary was dead. And this is how Moses and Susan Carver came to raise that little boy, George oh, Washington. Oh, really? So if you stop and think about it, wasn't it truly the farmer from Diamond, Missouri that saved the lives of over 2 billion people and counting? Yes. Unless, and that's the point, we can do this all night long. Yeah. Who knows who it was that made one move on one day that changed the lives for over 2 billion people and counting. Right. And who knows, watching this show right now, who is going to be in your life? What move you're going to make on which day that's going to save the lives of over 2 billion people and counting? We don't know the power of our actions, but I bought me a magnet at the Holocaust Museum in D.C. that says what we do matters. Yes. And it's on my fridge. But guess what? It, the opposite is true, too. What we don't do matters. Yes. Because there's things you know you ought to be doing right now and you're not doing them. Right. Whatever that is, you know. You yes. know, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to play guilt trip here, but listen, we all know there's stuff we should be doing. Oh, for so sure. it's not only what we do, but what we don't do that matters. Have yeah. you ever seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Yes. Mm -hmm. Remember George Bailey, how he had that wish at the end when he was just going through hell and like he's going to go to jail and all this stuff. He says, I wish mm -hmm. I'd never been born. Yeah. Right. Well, look at all these people that, that kill themselves. Mm -hmm. They had those same thoughts of George Bailey. And in the movies, thank heavens, God gave him a little glimpse of what life would be like if he had he not been born. Yeah. And it was ugly. It was dark. He wasn't there to stop the man from putting the poison in the pills. So yeah. this man like ends up ruining his life. He becomes like this drunk. And then he wasn't there to save his brother, Harry. 
you know, who fell on the ice and then Harry wasn't there to save the guys in World War II that all drowned. Right. You know what I'm saying? You see the butterfly effect in that? Yes, movie? yes. Here's the point. We don't know what power we have to change the world. Can one True. person change the world? I'm sure that, that Moses that night, Moses Carver in Diamond, Missouri, didn't think that saving a little baby boy's life was going to save the lives of two billion people. Right. So we don't know the good that we have in, within us and the good that we can put into the, the universe yes, and the, the butterfly effects that we can have in our own lives. If we'll just take action yes. and stop thinking about it and do something, do it. Yeah. Right. Just oh, do it. Nike. hundred percent. Yes. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love well, this it. This has been awesome to be on your show. And I hope that everybody, if they want to hear more, you know, we're going to have you on my show. I'm super excited to have yeah. Stacy on my show and uh but i have a podcast that i love to let people know about too and that's called achieving awesomeness now we're gonna have stacy on there so come listen to her interview as well and we just love to just inspire people to be their best step into their greatness and inspire others to do the same and that's what you're all about and that's why birds of a feather flock together yeah i reached out to her and i said stacy i love your podcast and is there a way we can like get noisy together you know what if we like helped each other and spread the word here on my channel and your channel and that's how we do it, guys. Yeah. Find the right people in your lives. Find the Stacys in your lives, the advisors that you need that are going to give you the counsel and be humble enough to take it because sometimes you're not going to like what they say, but we all <laughs> need coaching because we can't see the picture when we're in the frame. So exactly. get you get you an advisor today. You got one right here with Stacy. And I just want to thank you, Stacy, for having me on your show. Oh, you're and so hopefully welcome. your listeners got something out of this. Oh, Go I'm apply sure and go and thrive. Ah. Uh. Thank you so much, Nathan. This has been an honor. I thank you so much for being on the show. You are the man, I have to say. You are truly the man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're the woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. This has so, been awesome. Yeah, same here. You have a great day, Nathan. You too. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.